Define species. Why are dogs and wolves the same species but not lions and tigers? The dogs and wolves can breed with each other to produce offspring and this offspring is also fertile so it can also reproduce. So this Labrador wolf which is the product of the dog and the wolf is able to also have offspring. So a species is therefore a group of organisms that can reproduce with each other and then the offspring is also able to reproduce. And we could change this definition as a group of organisms that can breed to produce fertile offspring. Here's another example. All lions are the same species because they can reproduce with each other and then the offspring can also reproduce. So these lion cubs are fertile so when they're older and become an adult they will also be able to have offsprings. Lions and tigers are not the same species because although they can reproduce as shown by the liger example the liger is infertile so it can't reproduce to produce offsprings. So therefore being the same species is not about whether you can reproduce to f produce an offspring is whether your offspring can also reproduce. All organisms have an international scientific name so that it, they are recognized throughout the whole world and this usually involves two words. The first word is the genus and the second word is the species and this is known as the binomial system. Bi because it involves two, nomial because it's the naming system so using two words to name organisms. If you ever get a branching diagram in the exam, just understand that where the branches meet is where there would have been a common ancestor. So to recognize the timeline of the common ancestor, you look at the time across and you'll notice that humans and chimpanzees had a common ancestor roughly five to six million years ago. And this common ancestor is now extinct. Here you can see the common ancestor of gorillas, chimpanzees and humans which is roughly 8 million years ago. And then if we include orangutans as well, that's 13 million years ago. So where branches meet is where there was a common ancestor and this common ancestor would be extinct. If we look more closer between the human and chimpanzees, again here we could see that the common ancestor was roughly between 5 to 6 million years ago. And then we could use fossils to find out about human evolution. And the ones you need to know for your exams are Ardi, Lucy and Leakey's fossil discovery. So first if we look at the skulls of those organisms or species we can see that there is a gradual change. So evolution is a gradual change in characteristics of a species over time. So this would involve several different characteristics that is gradually changing, making the species different to each other. If we look at the characteristics and how they've changed, we could not only talk about the volume of the skull, we could also talk about their leg bones and also their limbs. So in exam question, describe the evidence for human evolution based on fossils. You want to state that fossils of human ancestors have characteristics that are between apes and humans. And this obviously will suggest how humans have evolved. So when you look at the fossil age, as it decreases from RD to Lucy to Lycus fossil to modern humans, we can see a trend in the fossil. And that trend displays an increase in brain size which is the same as the increase in skull size. We can also see that the leg bones are more efficient at walking upright. This means that the limb size is more like human 
then ape. So the arms are getting more and more shorter and the legs are getting longer and this is why uh, those species are becoming more and more taller and they are also less hairy. So those are the gradual characteristics that are changing that you want to note down as evidence for human evolution. However, we can't be 100% sure that modern humans evolved from human-like animals such as Adi. We know that evolution is a gradual change in the characteristics of a species over time, but the problem is that there are gaps in the fossils evidence. And because there are gaps, that means that the fossils don't show a smooth change over time. And this could be because some of these fossils have not been discovered. And that is why we're not 100% sure that modern humans evolved from human-like animals such as Adi. The other issue is that when we find fossils, sometimes we don't find fossils of the whole organisms and therefore we don't have a complete record of the smooth changes that are happening. One other evidence you could talk about for human evolution is how stone tools have changed. When we find stone tools, these stone tools can be dated not by finding the date of the stone, but by finding the age of the layer of rock where the stone tools are found. This is because the age of the stone gives information when the rock was formed, so that's not useful. You want to know the age of when the tool was made and used, and the only way to do that is by looking at the age of the layer of rock where the stone tool was found. When you look at the trend, you'll notice that the stone tools have become more sophisticated. And this indicates that as the brains of human-like species became larger, they were more capable of finer skills. And to do those finer skills, they needed stone tools that were more sophisticated. And this relates to what we learned in a previous unit, where an increase in brain is most likely to be due to an increase in the cerebellum and we know that the cerebellum is involved in having fine muscle movements so this will require the need for having stone tools that are more sophisticated. When writing about evolution it's important to know the difference between evolution and natural selection. So we stated earlier that evolution is a gradual change in characteristics of a species over time that is the idea, the theory but how did it occur? How it occurred was through natural selection. So this is the explanation for how evolution occurred. So natural selection explains how one species can gradually change into another. It's the explanation of the idea. So in other words, it's the theory of evolution explained by natural selection. And this was the idea that, came, that Darwin came up with. So explain Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. And here we can use the idea of giraffes and how their necks got longer. Whenever you get an exam question on natural selection, you want to remember the key words in the correct order. So first is genetic variation, then it's competition, survival and inheritance. So if we look at the example here for the giraffes, we can see that the genetic variation is due to mutations. And this means that some of the giraffes have short necks, and then due to the mutations, others will have longer necks. Then there'll be a change in the environment. So in this case, there's a lack of food. Most of the time, it would be a lack of resources such as food, but it could also be trying to escape from a predator or catching prey. And then in this example, the longer neck giraffes are more likely to survive because they are better adapted to reach food. So in the exam, you should mention who's more likely to survive, which variant, and then also mention why, because they are better adapted to 
for what they're competing for. And then in the final step, you want to mention the gene or allele that is inherited in the offspring. Offspring more likely to inherit longer neck gene or alleles, as longer neck giraffes are more likely to survive and reproduce. Don't forget to mention gene stroke allele. They're not inheriting longer neck, they're inheriting longer neck genes or longer neck alleles. And this means that the offspring are more likely to have those characteristics because they've inherited the allele or gene from the parents who are more likely to survive and reproduce because they're better adapted. They can ask you about any natural selection question in the exam, but the most likely question will be about antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And you have to know this example as evidence of how natural selection occurs. One of the best examples of natural selection happening in everyday life is antibiotic resistance. When you get an infection, it is usually caused by bacteria. Antibiotics are chemicals that kill bacteria. But when you take an antibiotic, some of the individual bacteria cells may be resistant to the antibiotic and not be killed. This usually isn't a problem because your immune system can deal with a few stragglers. But over time, those resistant bacterial cells tend to survive and reproduce more than their non-resistant cousins. Eventually, most of the bacteria cells in a region will be resistant to the antibiotic, and the medicine no longer has any effect on the infections. Disease So again, you can see from this example, when explaining natural selection, you want to use the same keywords genetic variation, competition, survival and inheritance and you want to explain it. So in a bacterial population there will be variation and due to mutation some of those bacteria will have the resistant gene or allele for antibiotics. The environmental change will be the addition of antibiotics and this means that those that are most resistant are more likely to survive and because they're more likely to survive because they have the antibiotic resistant gene stroke allele that means that they are more likely to reproduce and this means that all the bacteria in the future are likely to be resistant to antibiotic because they've inherited the antibiotic resistant gene or allele So here are the words written, you can see that organisms have genetic variation, some bacteria are more resistant than others, there's a change in the condition, the environment with the addition of antibiotics, those bacteria that have the antibiotic resistant gene are more likely to survive and therefore reproduce, and then bacteria in the future will all have the resistant gene or allele because they were inherited from the bacteria that survived. And then notice that natural selection occurs over and over again and this is how the organisms evolve. So to understand this, don't forget that evolution is a gradual change in the characteristics of a species over time. So it's not just one characteristic, just having longer neck in giraffes doesn't make you a new species. There's got to be several characteristics that have changed due from natural selection. And once those several characteristics have changed, that means that the two populations are so different that they can't interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring. And this is when they are a new species, but obviously they'll be very close related species. So in the exam, after mentioning all the key words of genetic variation, competition, survival, inheritance. To get the additional extra marks towards the end, 
you want to mention that there are too many differences to a point where the organisms or the variants that have survived are so different that they can't breed with the other population such that they become a new species. So here is the example of the Gentoo penguin which was a six mark question. Explain how the Gentoo penguin species could have evolved from this different species and as you can see when you look at the stages of natural selection using all the keywords there's variation amongst the penguins some of the penguins are more streamlined than others you can mention this is due to a mutation this means that those penguins were better at swimming so when there was competition to catch food or to escape from a predator the more streamlined penguins were more likely to survive and this means that they're more likely to reproduce and the streamlined gene will therefore be passed on and inherited in the offspring and then to get the additional marks this is the most difficult part that a lot of students miss out the penguins become so different from their ancestors they can't interbreed and produce fertile offspring so therefore they've become a new species and this is the additional thing that you have to mention to get the extra couple of marks in a six mark question So we can see that example again using mammoth and Asian elephants as an example. You can see here is the common ancestor which is Primelephus, which is an extinct common ancestor that lived roughly 4 million years ago. There would have been genetic variation. Some of the Primelephus were better adapted to colder temperatures because they had more hair. So when it became colder, these were the animals that were more likely to survive and reproduce. And therefore more of the population had those hair, uh, more hair alleles or genes, which was then passed on to their offspring because they're more likely to survive and reproduce. So you can see how the mammoths became different to the Asian elephants to a point where they couldn't breed and produce fertile offspring and more so they became a new species but then don't forget evolution is a gradual change in characteristics so that would not just be the only characteristic there would be other characteristic differences so if you look at this example we can see that the mammoths had longer and curved tusks so that's an example of other characteristics that would be different so several characteristics changing over time makes it a new species and eventually gets to the point where they can't reproduce and produce fertile offspring with the Asian elephants such that they become a new species. Now Darwin got the idea that organisms normally produce more offspring than could survive. So in other words there'd be competition and then those individuals that are better suited to the surroundings they're better adapted to survive will therefore reproduce and pass on their characteristics through the genes into their offspring. Now he used those ideas on his research when he went to the Galapagos Islands and he noticed that Galapagos finches were found nowhere else on earth and must have descended from a common ancestor that lived in the same region. So it's very likely a Galapagos finch migrated from South America to these islands and that would have been the early common ancestor that is now extinct. And when he looked at those Galapagos finches he noticed that there was variation. So some of these finches had bigger beaks and some of them had smaller beaks and then some were more pointed than others. So this would be due to a mutation. And the types of finches that were found were different in different islands and this was clearly due to the environmental change. So certain islands had different food. So for instance, if this island here had nuts, that means that 
the finches reared larger beaks were the only ones that were more likely to survive in those conditions and therefore reproduce so the offspring were more likely to have the larger beaks so here they're competing for food and the better adapted finches would be the ones that can get the food better so it'd be the larger beak finches they're more likely to survive through competition and therefore they're more likely to reproduce and pass on those genes the large beak genes to their offspring in a different island the environment might be different so here on another island maybe the food source was insects so therefore the finches with smaller more pointed beaks are more likely to survive and therefore reproduce so that means the offspring are more likely to have smaller more pointed beaks which they would have inherited from their parents who were better adapted to survive and reproduce and then don't forget after a period of time there's too much difference in the population that they can't breed and produce fertile offspring so these different finches therefore became different species So when you mention that at the end, you get the additional marks. Another evidence for evolution that Darwin thought about was the fact that certain organisms had similar structures and these structures were the pentadactyl limbs. They had similar bone structure in pentadactyl limbs in each species but they were used for different functions such as flying or swimming, walking or grasping. So it didn't make sense that all these different species had pentadactyl limbs but they were using it for different functions. This means that the species with pentadactyl limbs must have evolved from a common ancestor that also had pentadactyl limbs. The other features show differences and this must have been due to natural selection so there would have been selection pressure or environmental differences and that's why bats have wings or chickens have feathers or dolphins have flippers but the internal structure was the same so it didn't make sense so the only way that all of these different species would have had pentatopal limbs is that they inherited it from a common ancestor who also had pentadactyl limb and this common ancestor now would have been extinct we can split these two organisms into animals and plants so when you group organism this is known as classification we know from earlier that in the binomial system where you're naming organisms through the international scientific name this involves two words and the first word would be the genus and the second word would be the species name so for instance humans are known as homo sapiens and when we classify humans we come under the animal kingdom so looking at the two groups earlier we've got the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom and this is based on their characteristics there are three other kingdoms they're called fungi, protists and prokaryotes. Organisms are grouped into the five kingdoms based on their characteristics. So as technology improved such as microscopes we can now group them based on the characteristics of their cells. So for instance animals being multicellular having nucleus and no cell walls but plants having those cellular cell walls and also having chloroplasts for photosynthesis. So the features, the characteristics they have distinguish them based on which group we can then place them into. However, there are problems using this method of classification because if we base it on how they look or what features they have, characteristics, <coughs> 
some of these characteristics are shared in different groups. So this duckbill platypus has features that are similar to mammals and also birds. So how would you classify it? Now here's another example. We've got sharks and dolphins both both have features that are similar. They're both streamlined and because they're streamlined this means that you group them together. But we know that they're streamlined because through natural selection they have adapted to survive in those conditions and that's why they look similar. It's not because they're closely related. We now use DNA evidence to group organisms together and this is known as genetic analysis. Here the more DNA that is similar to each other the more closely related organisms are. So for instance all humans can be grouped together because roughly 99% of our DNA matches each other. And then we could group humans closely to other apes because there's a higher percentage DNA similarity. So the more similarity there is in the DNA, the more closer related. And this is known as genetic analysis. Now if we look at our five kingdoms and do genetic analysis of these five kingdoms, we can split them and we can see which kingdoms are more closely related to each other. A couple of decades ago they found these single celled organisms known as archaea which looked very similar to bacteria and because they looked similar to bacteria they were grouped together as prokaryotes. After doing genetic analysis we noticed that they have more similarity in their DNA or genes with eukaryotes. So even though they look like bacteria and were grouped in the prokaryote kingdom, genetic analysis shows that they're more closely related to eukaryotes. This means that genetic analysis has led to the three domain classification system called bacteria, archaea and eukaryotes instead of the five kingdom system. So we've been using the five kingdom system for a couple of centuries now based on their characteristics but using genetic analysis we now group organisms using the three domain classification system and this is because looking at the similarity of DNA is better in grouping organisms than looking at their characteristics. So why were some classification based on characteristics wrong? This is because the characteristics were similar due to adaptation to the environment such as the shark and the dolphin. Sharks are fish, dolphins are mammals. They're not closely related to each other but they look similar because of the adaptation to the same environment. Genetic analysis is better because the environment doesn't change the DNA. So therefore the closer your DNA stroke gene matches the more closer related you are and this is better evidence than using characteristic. So in the exam if they ask why have we changed the classification system you need to have an understanding that genetic analysis is a better way of grouping organisms because using DNA or looking at genes in terms of the similarities is much better at grouping organisms to show which organisms are closer related than looking at their characteristic which is the old system. And this means now that all organisms are first grouped based on the domains bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes than using the five kingdom classification system. When thinking about the plant cuttings practical, you can see that here there's only one parent involved 
Therefore, there's no gametes or fertilization. So this type of reproduction is asexual, which makes that the new plant is genetically identical to the parent plant. Tissue culture is when you can grow cells or tissues and this means that those cells or tissues will be genetically identical. In other words, it's a method of cloning. For growth to occur, we need to understand is growth is when you're adding more cells and this happens by a type of cell division known as mitosis. Now these cells will be genetically identical because of mitosis but then to make them different to each other we're using stem cells because stem cells can divide by mitosis and then those cells because they're stem cells you're producing genetically identical unspecialized cells which then become more specialized by differentiation so if you want to make more cells or tissues you want to use stem cells because they're the cells that can do mitosis and then differentiate to become more specialized. So if you're doing tissue culture on plants, you want to use meristem cells and they're found on the tips of roots and shoots. And they're the cells that can divide and differentiate when doing plant cuttings. So when you're doing your plant cutting, remember this is a method of cloning first you want to stop other microorganisms that could harm the plant that could kill the plant cells and the way to get rid of them is by sterilizing your plant and all the equipment this is known as aseptic technique which you learn in SB5 And then you either take a few of the cells, and obviously stem cells were the best cells to take, so in plants it would be meristem cells, or you could take the tissues, so again meristem tissues. And you want those cells to grow, so you want to add more cells. So that means that these meristem cells have to divide by mitosis, and that requires providing nutrients, so you want to give them nutrients. And then this will form plant callus. So because you started off with unspecialized stem cells through mitosis you're producing a lump of unspecialized genetically identical cells as well. And then to develop the shoots and roots you want these cells to differentiate and this requires providing them with growth hormones. So the two things you want to provide in tissue culture are nutrients and growth hormones. And then obviously when the organism is large enough you could place it into a uh, soil or compost. And that means that you've now produced a genetically identical organism through plant cutting or through tissue culture. In other words, you produce a clone. So you can see in this example here, you take a cutting from a plant, either a cell or tissues. You want to take the meristem cells because they're the cells that could do mitosis and also then differentiate. First you want to sterilize things and that's to get rid of any microorganisms that could kill the plant cells. You take cells or tissues and then you want them to grow and the only way they're going to grow is by providing them nutrients and this means that these cells stroke tissues can then do mitosis. And because they're doing mitosis that means that there are more cells now but they'll all be genetically identical so they'll also be unspecialized. This produces a plant callus 
to develop the roots and shoots you therefore have to provide the callus with growth hormones and this causes the cells to differentiate and become more specialized So just go through that. How are microbes that kill plant cells prevented from growing? You want to use aseptic or sterile conditions. What is removed from parent plant and where are they located? You're taking away meristem cells or tissues from the tips of shoots or roots. To make them grow, you provide nutrients. This means that they do mitosis and that produces a clump of genetically identical unspecialized cells known as callus. These cells then become specialized by providing growth hormone and this causes the cells to differentiate and become more specialized. When it's large enough you can then place them into a soil or compost. So effectively the whole point of producing tissue culture which is cloning is to produce more cells or tissues and this is really important if you have species that are at risk of extinction because it gives you an opportunity to make more of those organisms. You could also use tissue culture for plant species that are really difficult to grow from their seeds. So remember in tissue culture you're only using a plant, there are no gametes involved, it's asexual reproduction so you don't require seeds so if there is an organism that is very difficult to grow from seeds, tissue culture is a solution. And tissue culture is also used to produce clones of genetically modified plants because therefore they'll have those genes. So there are lots of advantages of doing tissue culture cloning. In exam, the two biggest reasons for doing tissue culture should be you can produce plants quicker. So by producing plants quicker it's a lot more faster to get the plants growing because you don't need any involvement of seeds or fertilization or gametes. So it's faster because you're growing from a few cells or tissues. The other big advantage of tissue culture is you're producing genetically identical organism to the parent plant. And therefore, if your parent plant has got desirable characteristics, such as a strawberry that tastes really juicy and has lots of flavor, by using tissue culture, you're producing organisms that will be genetically identical. So they will have the same characteristic because there is no genetic variation. This is not guaranteed if you're growing the seeds. When you're doing tissue culture, you don't have to just do them in plants only using meristem cells. They could be done in animals as well. So you would use the tissue specific adult stem cells. So an example of this is how burgers are grown in labs. So again, you're taking adult stem cells from a cow. You grow them in tissue culture. So don't forget, you want to make sure you sterilize and then you want to provide both nutrients and growth hormones and this will cause the adult stem cells to grow so it adds more cells by cell division of mitosis and then those cells can also differentiate but in your exam they ask you to describe the process of tissue culture and its advantages in medical research and plant breeding programs so therefore you can't mention about lab burgers, you want to mention in animals the medical research. So one example of this is producing artificial or synthetic organs. And so if you're using stem cells and growing more of the stem cells from the same person, that means that the immune system 
will recognize those cells and will not attack it. In other words, the artificial synthetic organ will not be rejected. So remember in tissue culture, cloning, you are producing more cells or tissues. So using your own cells to produce these uh, cells or tissues, they will not be rejected. There are other advantages of tissue culture. For instance, if you want to study how cells work, or how viruses affect cells, or how cancerous cells work, or how a new medicine work, which is another good example. In addition to generating cells here, for tissue and transplantation, you could it make is cells or tissues, that by using ES cells derived and then from patients with known genetic defects related to ALS, cells, Alzheimer's and you can disease, see how the or cells react to the drugs. Researchers will be able to develop so one and test drugs culture, that might prove valuable test in the treatment of, drugs, of the disease. But this requires you making cells, so to make the cells you'd use tissue culture. So describe the process of tissue culture and its advantages in medical research and plant breeding programs. In plant breeding, we know that you can produce plants that don't grow easily from seed. They'll be virus-free plants, produce many plants of endangered species. But your top answer should be that you could produce lots of genetically identical plants very quickly. So not only is it quickly, the fact that it's genetically identical means that it would have your characteristics that you want which will be the same as the parent plant. And then the advantages in medicine, you can produce synthetic organs to replace damaged ones, and those synthetic organs will not be rejected because you're using the stem cells from the same person. And then obviously alternative answers would be, you could study the effect of new medicine to see how those cells react. And then to make those cells clearly, you'd you be using tissue culture. Moving on, what is natural selection? How does selective breeding work? So remember, in natural selection, characteristics are selected that are useful for survival. And this is based on nature. So in other words, it could be competition for resources, or competition to escape from a predator, or to catch a prey. And then those organisms that are better adapted to do those things in competition have the characteristics that are selected and because they're more likely to survive, that means they're more likely to reproduce and pass on the genes of those characteristics to their offspring. Artificial selection is different because this is where the characteristics are selected that are useful to humans. So humans are selecting the characteristics that they want in the offspring. And the best example of this is selective breeding. So if you look at the example below, we've got a Brahmin cattle that has the good resistance to heat but produces poor beef. We've got an English shorthorn cattle that produces good beef but poor heat resistance. So if you're a farmer who wants a cattle that produces lots of beef and can survive in hot conditions, that means you could do selective breeding. So in this example, you'd hope that the good beef allele would be in your gamut from one cattle and the other cattle would provide the good resistance to heat and when those gametes fuse together in fertilization you could produce an offspring that has got good heat resistance and beef. So in other words here humans are selecting the characteristics they want in the offspring and this is known as artificial selection, which is obviously different to natural selection. I mean, you see that example in humans, when humans reproduce, they have offsprings that have similar characteristics to the parents. So in the example we saw in the video, in lessons, is when Leonard said, our babies will be smart and beautiful. So that's the hope that those genes we inherited from the parents. In the exam, you'd have to mention the step-by-step -step process of how selective breeding works. So first, you want to select the characteristics you're after. So in this case here, we want to produce large apples. 
and then you want to breed them with each other. When you breed them with each other, not all the apples will be large, some of them will be small. And we know that because if you look at Mendel's um, ideas earlier from the previous unit, we understand that we have two copies of every gene because obviously we've got two chromosomes of that one what we inherited from the mother and one from the father therefore we'll have two copies of genes and when you pass on those genes to your offspring you only pass on one of them so it's a 50-50 chance of which gene or allele that you're going to pass to your offspring so it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll pass the larger apple gene or larger apple allele to the offspring so to combat that you just select the best offspring you pick another two apples that are uh, produced that are large and you breed them together and you keep doing this process over several generations such that the desirable trait in this case large apples are more likely to occur in the offspring so just to recap first you select from the characteristics that you're interested in and you breed them together and then you pick the offspring that are the best of those characteristics and you keep breeding them together and you do this several times until all the, those, uh, the, those characteristics are in all the offspring. In the exam they ask you for advantage of selective breeding. The top two answers are increases your yield and also resistance. And resistance doesn't necessarily have to be having a resistance to disease. It could be like the example earlier, having a heat resistance or any other environmental resistance as well. So you could have your selecting for characteristics of those resistance that you want in the offspring. However, there are disadvantages for selective breeding because it is a type of inbreeding because you're crossing, you're crossbreeding with the same characteristics in the offspring and therefore there won't be much genetic variation between those offspring they will be very similar identical and this could cause lots of genetic faults you can see in this example that harmful recessive alleles are more likely to accumulate when you're doing inbreeding compared to outbreeding where there's more variation so the disadvantage of selective breeding is that there's accumulation of harmful recessive alleles which increases your chance of having these diseases that are genetic but the top answer in your exam should be that it reduces the amount of variation you can see for both of those disadvantages using the English book bulldog is a very good example here inbreeding has caused bulldogs to have more flatter faces and that causes huge breathing problems but these are the characteristics that humans desire in their pet unfortunately there are lots of ethical considerations that you have to consider so you might get questioned based on ethics when it comes to selective breeding and so this would be a very good example of something that you discuss the other big disadvantage of selective breeding as we mentioned earlier is that there is less genetic variation so a really good recent example in news are Cavendish bananas which is the variety of bananas that we generally eat and because there's not a lot of genetic variation in those Cavendish bananas a recent new disease called Panama disease is affecting all the Cavendish bananas and this means that we have to think about what banana species that we eat because those Cavendish bananas are under threat from the new disease. So here the introduction of disease is now affecting all the Cavendish bananas because there's not a lot of variation in them. Genetic engineering is when you modify the genome of an organism. So you can see in this example here we want the cabbage to be venomous. Uh, we're changing the genome, the DNA of the cabbage, by inserting a gene from the scorpion. And the reason why we're doing this is we want to introduce desirable characteristics. So we want the cabbage to have 
the characteristics that we desire in the cabbage. So here the initial organism is a scorpion and we are inserting the venom gene from the scorpion into the cabbage so that the cabbage now produces venom which is poisonous to caterpillars acting as a pesticide Other examples we looked in lessons were glowfish, golden rice and spider goat. Now when you're eating food, the amount of glucose in your blood increases and having a high blood concentration of glucose is really bad for you. So that means our pancreas detects this and secretes a hormone called insulin which goes to the target organ liver this is a topic that you learn in the future in year 11 unless you've already covered it and what happens here is the liver then stores the excess glucose and decreases the amount of blood glucose concentration such that it is not toxic to the body anymore. Now some humans can't produce insulin. Because they can't produce insulin, we know that they are diabetic. So what they do is they inject insulin into their body. So this means that we have to produce insulin on a mass scale. And this could be done by genetic engineering. So to remember the steps of genetic engineering, first you have to select for the characteristics that you're interested. You want to then isolate the gene. You want to insert the gene into a different organism's genome. And then you want to replicate that organism. When doing genetic engineering, there are additional things that you have to remember. So if you want to isolate or cut the gene, the DNA out, you want to use restriction enzymes. These restriction enzymes produce sticky ends in the DNA. And then we can stick the sticky ends together by using another enzyme called ligase. And this works because the sticky ends have bases that are complementary to each other. So if we can remember the acronym GCAT, remember that guanine is complementary, base paired with cytosine, and adenine with thymine. So by isolating the DNA to cut it using restriction enzyme, it produces the same sticky ends, and then those sticky ends are complementary, so you can see that they will then stick to each other Researchers extract DNA from an organism that has a trait they want to introduce into a plant. The genetic donor can be a bacterial cell, a plant cell, or even an animal cell. The desired gene will be transferred into a plasmid, a small circle of bacterial DNA. The gene is cut out of the donor DNA by a restriction enzyme and ligated into the bacterial plasmid. This forms a genetically modified plasmid. The modified plasmid is inserted back into a bacterium. Genetically engineered bacteria are grown in tissue culture to produce multiple copies of the gene. The other thing to remember is that you, sometimes you have to use a DNA molecule that um, or a something called a vector where the DNA molecule is carried into the new organism. So in this case we're using a plasmid that will then transfer the gene into the organism that we want to have the desired characteristic. If you can remember from SB1, plasmids are genetic material found in bacteria that control a few of the cell's activities. 
So you can see in this example here, we've got the insulin gene from humans. We cut it by using restriction enzyme that produces sticky ends. We then use a plasmid vector and we cut it using the same restriction enzyme producing complementary uh, bases and sticky ends. We could join those sticky ends together using ligase. We then insert it back into the bacteria and reproduce it. And because the bacteria now has the gene, it can then produce insulin. So six mark exam question. Insulin is a protein made using GM bacteria. Describe how the manipulation of DNA may have been used to create these bacteria. You want to mention that you transfer the insulin gene from a human to a bacteria. Restriction enzyme cuts or isolates the insulin gene and this produces sticky ends. If you mention the sticky ends, there are additional marks there. And then you want to mention that the same restriction enzyme cuts the plasmid vector that also produces sticky ends. And then these sticky ends of the insulin gene and the plasmid vector can be joined together by using a ligase enzyme and this is because they are matching complementary base pairs for example guanine complementary base pairs with cytosine adenine complementary base pairs with thymine and then the plasmid can be inserted to the bacteria and the last step you want to mention that the plasmid is replicated by the bacteria because the bacteria will reproduce so that means through reproduction there'll be lots and lots of bacteria that have the plasmid that contains the insulin gene and they will produce the insulin. So don't forget here we're using plasmid as a vector because the plasmid is transferring the gene into the bacteria. But other vectors can be used so the other common one would be viruses. So in the exam mention what the vector is because there is an additional mark for that. Now one of the advantages of using genetic modification you want to, it's all about resistant genes. So you could talk about introducing things like pest resistant genes or frost, disease, herbicide, any of those examples. But your top answer should be any form of resistant genes. But don't forget you are producing an organism with your desired characteristic and the reason why they have the desired characteristic is because you've transferred a gene from another organism and inserted it into the organism that you want to have your desired characteristic. The disadvantage of genetic modification is that the organism can cross-pollinate with weeds or wild type plants. So GM crops will reproduce with wild plant varieties and that means they could pass on their resistant genes. So to summarize, don't forget in protein synthesis, you're using a gene and that gives you genetic code, the information to make a protein. In selective breeding, you're hoping for the genes to be taken from parents and for that gene to be inherited in the offspring. So that the offspring has your desired characteristic. Whereas in genetic engineering, you're transferring the gene from one organism and introducing it to another organism so the other organism now will have the desired characteristic because it will have the gene that you've transferred and because it has the gene it could do protein synthesis and produce the protein. What effect do pests have on crops and how can this problem be reduced? So you can see here you've got a grasshopper pest and it is reducing your yield. So usually, if you want to reduce this problem, you can use pesticide or insecticides. When you use that, the big problem is that when you spray it to the crop, they only affect the pest that is on the surface. This means that the pests inside the plant are not affected because they do not touch the insecticide. So to solve this problem, we could do genetic modification for the plant to produce its own insecticide in the cells. And so when pests eat those cells, 
they will be killed. This means that you need the insecticide from another organism that you can then transfer by genetic modification into the plant. A Bt toxin insecticide was found in soil bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. In the exam you should recognize that it produces Bt toxin. So if they ask you in the exam which organism produces Bt toxin originally, notice that the Bt are the first letters of the binomial name of this bacteria. And then you want to mention how to genetically modify a crop plant to produce the insecticide. So don't forget you've got all the keywords and the enzymes and you want to do exactly like the example of insulin. So you want to mention that you isolate the Bt toxin gene using restriction enzymes and this produces sticky ends and then you'd also use a plasmid vector and using the same restriction enzyme you'd cut the plasmid vector and that will also produce sticky ends and then you take the Bt toxin gene and you would join the sticky ends with the plasmid vector using ligase enzyme you'd put this modified plasmid into a bacteria that can infect the crop and after inserting it into that bacteria you will then in infect a crop the Bt toxin gene will be in the plant you'll grow more of those plant tissues by using tissue culture and then you grow it and then when the insects inside feed on the cells those cells will produce Bt toxin insecticide and will therefore die and this means that you don't have to spray insecticide on the surface because the crop plant will naturally produce it in cell because it now has the gene So you can see here, usually you would spray insecticide and that means that the, um, any pest on the surface will die, however pest inside would be unaffected. So the only way to combat this would be to produce genetically modified crops that produce the Bt toxin themselves and that means that you need to get the Bt toxin from that bacteria that produces it. You want to isolate the gene using restriction enzymes and then you want a plasmid vector to transfer the gene into the Bt corn or your crop and therefore any pest that eats the crop will die because the plant cells themselves will produce the Bt toxin insecticide. Now the advantage for this is that it increases the yield. Another advantage is that less pesticide is used because obviously you don't have to spray it on the crop. You don't have to use a lot of pesticide. So the overall advantage is the farmer's profit will increase. So in the exam, if they mention the advantages of using Bt toxin, you want to mention that the yield would increase, less use of pesticide, less pesticide costs, overall effect increasing farmers profit. The problem is some of the pests might through mutations have a resistance to the Bt toxin insecticide. So this is similar to the antibiotic resistance in bacteria that we learnt. So through natural selection if a few of them survive then future populations will be resistant to the Bt toxin gene, uh, Bt toxin insecticide. And this means that the insects have developed resistant to the Bt toxin. The other disadvantage is your GM crops might reproduce with wild plant varieties and pass on those resistant genes. So we don't know the effect that this will have on uh, other plants. Therefore, what are the alternative to insecticide? Because if you don't want to spray insecticides, 
and you don't want to use genetic modification then one way to kill the pest is by using an organism that will consume the pest so in this example of the grasshopper is the pest because it's reducing the yield of your corn we use a natural predator this in this case would be the frog and the frog will eat the grasshopper and control the population of the grasshopper and this is known as biological control because you are biologically controlling the pest population however there's a disadvantage to this because your biological control might eat other organisms so in this case they might not just select to eat the grasshoppers, they might also eat the butterflies. And these other organisms could be beneficial to you. So in this case, the butterflies help with pollination. So here's an example. There was a population of cane beetles in Australia that dramatically increased, and this affected the sugarcane crop yields. So to control them, a biological control was used. In this case it was the cane toad which was introduced from South America so remember the, you're introducing a species that are not naturally found in the area but there's a problem some of these cane toads were eating other organisms in the environment and the other problem were they were poisonous so they killed other organisms that ate the cane toads because they wouldn't usually eat cane toads naturally because they're not naturally found in the environment so if they ask you in the exam, what's the criteria used to judge whether an organism is suitable for using a budge control? You want to mention that the control organism must selectively choose the pests that you want to control. So you want them to eat your pest mainly and not eat other beneficial organisms or even eat your crop plants. So that means you have to think about what does it eat and does it um, poison anything that eats it the other thing you want to think about is whether your control organism stays mainly within the crop so if you're using for instance a biology control that's a bird they might fly and migrate to a different location now when we look at the human population we can see that human population is increasing and because it's increasing therefore we need more food so that means that we need to increase the yield you can use budge control, genetic modification and selective breeding to increase the amount of food we produce. Another way we could do this is by also using fertilizers. Fertilizers contain minerals such as nitrates, phosphates and potassium. As we learned from SB1, they are pointed to the soil and they move from a lower mineral concentration to a higher mineral concentration to the plant root hair cells by active transport. However, the disadvantage of fertilizers is if you excessively use fertilizers, or well, if it rains, those fertilizers go into things like rivers or lakes, and they cause the algae to grow much faster than usual and this type of pollution is known as eutrophication and SB4 you don't need to know the steps of eutrophication you learn that in future units in paper 2 so for paper 1 you just need to understand that the disadvantage of using fertilizer is it causes a pollution called eutrophication and this kills animals or organisms that are in the lake or the rivers